And uh, the, when the goalkeeper is close to the goal, maybe five feet in front of the goal, he can block almost any shot with enough uh, distance from the person who's kicking. But when he's at midfield, he can hardly block anything. And the analogy is that the low clouds are like the goalie near the goal, and the high cloud is way out there in the middle of the field. And a lot of ambient scattered light can come in behind that cloud and get into the goal, which is the surface. How does that analogy strike you? Um, I have to think very hard about that. I thought the reason was that we couldn't get the aerosol up there. Um, the, 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 you, you get a fairly even mixture through the turbulent boundary layer, uh, but you can't get it up there. I think the, the, the distance away uh, wouldn't really come into it. It doesn't with glass balls. I mean, here you are. You move it backwards and forwards and it doesn't change. But uh, I don't want to, to uh, rubbish an idea that I didn't understand. Right, right. No, I understand. I'll, I'll present the science on it. I've yeah. developed something called that I've called the cone of ambient reflection. And the low mm -hmm. cloud has a larger cone of, of ambient scattering coming into it. Uh, whereas the cloud at the top of the atmosphere, not an aerosol uh, generation, but an actual cirrus cloud or something, um, has a smaller cone of scattering above it, whereas the low cloud has all this scattering cone that it can then reflect back out. So well, um, using- oh, Also a question of the areas that have been covered. You know, you, you might say you've got a lot of reflection in a smaller area or a low reflection over a, a large area. And I'd rather go, for, if you look at the, the mathematics of Sean Toomey, uh, it looks as if it's better to have a low dose over a large area. Right, but the area should still more effectively be down near the surface of the uh, ocean rather than, let's say, at, you know, 30,000 feet or something. I Jonathan, I, I, don't, I don't think your analogy holds up because uh, if you, you compare a soccer pitch to uh, the distance from the Earth to the sun, uh, mm. really the, uh, like, the clouds are uh, are effectively yeah. part of the Earth system, uh, essentially standing on the goal line um, uh, by uh, by comparison. Um, so uh, yeah, the, the uh, uh, it's yeah it's uh, I think it's always interesting to think through uh, these sorts of analogies. You know, do they make sense? And that you, like we we find uh, so many uh, different analogies for. Uh, uh, for climate effects, which can um, help to simplify and explain things for for the general public, uh, and yeah, very good to uh, to think it through. Um, I, I I agree with Stephen on this one, um, but uh, let's uh, let's move on now. Uh, John Nissen said he's uh, the call, but I think he's had to step away. So um, we'll we'll just. Uh, Get underway uh, and uh, welcome everyone to uh, to this meeting of the Planetary Restoration Action Group. It's, uh, it's good to see um, everyone here. And uh, as uh, as John Nissen uh, uh, commented in his um, uh, email inviting us all to the call, there's uh, uh, a really quite a, a good level of um, uh, activity uh, happening, and the, I, th I think the thing that's really um, caught my eye at most is the uh, the talk by um, George Soros to the uh, Munich Security Conference. So um, I was uh, I was interested to uh, to open up that conversation. Now I see uh, John Nissen uh, is no. with us, so. Uh, uh, John, you're you're welcome to uh, uh, to jump in. Um, I'm uh, I'm just uh, opening up the uh, the like I, I, Soros is such a significant figure, and mm. his uh, his uh, his 
uh, what I was particularly interested in was his specific use of uh, Stephen Salter's uh, marine cloud brightening technology uh, with the endorsement of uh, Sir David. And uh, so I'd, I'd really actually be interested um, in uh, in Stephen uh, thoughts on um, on the uh, on the Soros talk and uh, like I, we I think we understand that uh, as we've just been talking about between high clouds and low clouds that there was a bit of a technical mistake in uh, in, mm. in Sir David's uh, analysis like I, I think that's neither here nor there uh, but uh, it's uh, uh, um, uh, even so, uh, like uh, the potential to uh, to get uh, funding and political support for um, uh, for trials of marine cloud brightening uh, arising from uh, from Soros's uh, uh, endorsement is quite interesting. So, uh, I mean, John, you might like to speak, but I, I'd also just be interested to hear from Stephen. Uh, yeah. Um, well, uh, yeah. Before we, uh, I, I might correct you in that uh, I don't know whether the, the high high level cloud was deliberate might have been deliberate um, uh, re reference to uh, stratospheric aerosol injection and I know that uh, David, David King's team is keeping that option open and I think it's extremely important for the for our future well-being that that is kept open because we do know pretty we can be very high highly confident that it would work and pretty com and highly confident that it it is scalable and highly confident that it could be scaled up quickly um so so that is our main uh, our mainstay uh, of of confidence in being able to uh, refreeze the Arctic. Uh, if something else can be developed uh, which can do the job uh, better and safer, or in some way better, uh, let's let's get on and and, uh, and and get it get it moving. But um, but uh, a stratospheric aerosol injection has to be our first first line of attack, if you like, um, because we can we could uh, get it going very quickly. Um, you can't so stop I, it very quickly, I, Stephen. You, I said you can't stop it very quickly. You've got to get it right. Uh, yeah. So 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 uh, so. Um, Doug McMartin has has uh, considered that uh, he's considered the, the the warming effect it has in winter, and he's uh, his modelling has shown that it would be ex an extremely small amount compared with the uh, with the cooling that he's doing. Let's hope he's right, but I'd like to be sure. Uh, and if you get it wrong, you're stuck with it. If he's wrong. And well, the, the, the crucial the crucial thing is uh, is the lifetime, um, and that can be uh, varied. Uh, I think he's in his calculations he's assumed a uh, a lifetime of uh, five months, and and we don't know with the Brewer Dobson circulation whether that's a sharp cut off or or a weak cut off. I think he assumes it's a fairly weak cut off. And so there might be a little bit left uh, in winter if you're injecting in late spring or early summer. Uh, we, we have discussed this many times, Stephen. So I, don't, I really Stephen, don't want your... to go on yeah. because I, what I want to focus on uh, at this meeting is getting, uh, building on uh, what Soros has said uh, in terms of refreezing the Arctic, building on uh, Sir David's uh, work and refreezing the Arctic is absolutely key uh, to the um, to, to the, our future on this planet because of all the tipping points in the Arctic, which you which I list from time to time and uh, occasionally add one. So. Um, 
Uh, so I've had, added the A mark as being another uh, tipping point um, uh, relatively recently. Uh, yeah, we... I'm interested to ask Stephen his uh, his impression of the Soros paper, if that's all yeah, right with yeah. you. Yeah, okay. Over, over to you, Stephen. Sorry to uh, interrupt rather longly. Uh, <laughs> well, a long time ago, when I was trying to get rid of anti-personnel mines, Soros said the same sort of thing about anti-personnel mines. And I tried to get some money from him to build a machine uh, and it didn't work. This time I've written to his foundation and said, uh, et cetera, I was trying to do. And I haven't heard back from them except them to say that they didn't respond to applications. They like to choose who to offer money to. Uh, so uh, it looks as if I may have had nearly two rejections from Soros. So we'll see what happens. The design of the spray vessels is very, very nearly complete. I'm finding it harder to find the things that are, haven't been drawn and calculated. So we're very close to being able to start making stuff and testing the components. And excellent. Uh, okay, so that's excellent, couple, excellent news. A couple of questions. Um, I, I think that uh, to engage with Soros, it's probably up to Sir David King uh, to do that. And uh, so, uh, like, it wouldn't be. Um, sensible to uh, to try uh, an uncoordinated mm. approach mm. to the Soros Foundation mm. or an individual approach. Uh, and uh, so uh, have you uh, have you been in touch with the, the Cambridge Centre about uh, about following up with them? Uh, I sent David King uh, an email to thank him for what he'd been saying. Yeah, but uh, um, that, that, that there's not not much further than that. Yeah. All right. Well, I, I think that uh, I've been in uh, in contact with um, Sean Fitzgerald and Hugh Hunt at the Cambridge Centre uh, to uh, to talk about um, convening a, a symposium on uh, Arctic freezing and brightening the planet in in May or June. Uh, they, so they're interested in that. I've, I've flagged that with uh, with people here. So I hope we'll be able to uh, to find a suitable. Um, date and, and venue uh, for that. Mm. Um, and I've sent you some calculations about that, and the number of vessels that you need. You, you, did you get that all right? But uh, the number of vessels for for cooling the Arctic. Yes, I've you've you've uh, yeah, I've supplied that. that. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and uh, yeah. There's been a few uh, comments on that. And uh, Brian asks, would the summit be online? And uh, uh, my preference uh, would be, uh, well, I'm not sure that we would call it a summit, but uh, a, uh, I, I've used the term symposium or seminar. Um, and uh, I would uh, expect that we would uh, include uh, as a hybrid, both in person and, and online, if it's possible to organize that. So uh, uh, I've suggested a couple of uh, updates um, either the 20th of May or, or early June when uh, when I would be available in Cambridge. And right. so I, I hope that that will be possible. Um, the uh, I, I did want to, maybe we can come back to that question, but uh, I wanted to ask Stephen, um, you, you were just saying that you're uh, close to final with your uh, understanding of the the design, but that's without any uh, material construction, I assume. And it, it also uh, includes the question of uh, getting the spray nozzles right. Um, we did etch some spray nozzles uh, using an etching technology, which was rather crude and coarse. And we got down to double the diameter that we want to have. We know that we could get uh, down to the size that we think is right. Uh, with a optical rather than a contact print. Uh, so quite a lot of, um, of, of chips were made like this. I've actually shown them to David King. Uh, however, when I was having, having to move from my office from Edinburgh University, <laughs> I put the chips in a box with all the most precious uh, things that I wanted to get moved. And that box was stolen by the uh, the movers, and uh, so the chips have gone. Uh, we had quite a, quite a lot of them. 
um, little 10 millimeter square mirrors they look like you can't see anything from one side and you can see a darker gray patch from the the big the big side of the, of the nozzles you have tiny tiny holes etched through a thin thing on one side joining a big hole when, when i say big i mean 50 microns uh, on the other side and uh, that technique really worked very well indeed they were etched by a lady called camellia dunari uh, who's very good on silicon wafers well that's unfortunate to lose your materials stephen yeah. uh, robert chris wants to speak yeah i just wanted to ask you stephen when i was in uh, cambridge uh, a couple of weeks ago i met jake who i believe you've been in contact with and he's he's working i think on your on you on reconstructing or or re re engineering what you did. Do you know how he's getting on? No, I don't. Uh, I've, I've been in touch with somebody. I can't remember what the name was now, but it was at least six months ago. Uh, oh right. Used... right. This is a, this for everybody else's benefit. This is a young uh, fourth year engineering student um, mm -hmm. who um, Hugh Hunt um, is totally and utterly enamoured by. Mm -hmm. um, Good. And um, he is working on a on a project for his final uh, sessions, which includes a number of things, but particularly um, re-engineering um, uh, the, the, the nozzles that um, mm. uh, that Stephen produced. And I think he's been in touch with uh, your lady, who uh, who actually did yeah. the work. Good. And he, but when I was there, he would just I uh, actually had lunch with him. He had just emerged from some special laboratory where he'd been learning how to use an electron microscope. Which, they, mm -hmm. which he's going to need in order to um, complete the project. So uh, he's obviously, they're obviously kind of engaged in it. It'll be interesting to see. And, yeah. and the project has only it's got a short horizon. It's you know, a matter of two or three months, I think. So yeah. we should get something out of that fairly quickly. Uh, and I think he, he, he's working on your ideas you, you and need, others as well. You need to have ways to back flush the nozzles with uh, filtered air and filtered fresh water. Mm -hmm. And you also want to have them very close to an ultrasonic cleaner. So mm -hmm. you, you have to assume that the some of it, the plankton that you thought you'd filtered out actually mm -hmm. uh, haven't, you know, have managed to get past the filter, and you've got to be able to back flush them a second time. I'm not familiar with the precise details of exactly of the engineering uh, issues mm -hmm. he's confronted with, but I know that he's working on it, uh, which is uh, actively working on it, which is kind of encouraging. And Stephen, how close is very close for ultrasonication? Say again, please. How close is very close for ultrasonication? What are your uh, distance requirements? Uh, well, um, I think we have to prove the filtration first of all. And the way we want to do that is to have a four group of four filters. And we have three of them in what's called a back flash ring, where this water from some of them is going the wrong way through the others. And the way to do this is to have the, the, the group of three feeding water to number four, and then you just measure the pressure drop across number four. And if the first three filters have been doing the job properly, then the pressure across number four will stay steady. And if they're not, then it's going to gradually rise. So this is the first step to do. And once you've done that, you can then start uh, pumping water through nozzles. And... Uh, so that you can do uh, with um, I think probably the best way is to, is to catch some of the spray and dry it and measure the salt crystals that you the size of salt crystals you get through. Um, I'm really convinced that we need to have a very narrow spread of drop sizes, and there's one work from one paper from Norway which confirms this. Uh, I want to help get them all. Uh, nucleating or none of them nucleating uh, uh, with, with a bit like well-trained infantry. Uh, I, I think if you've got a turbulent flow and there's different sizes of, of drops, they'll collide into each other and you'll get coalescence losses. Uh, but the kind of detail that I'm looking at now is how all the hoses will be laid out in the, in the vessel and also the tooling that we need to make the rotors. So we've got to make Flatten rotors that are much lighter than any of the ones that are around now, and this needs a rather special machine tool to uh, to produce the the, the building for it. And are you aiming for uh, two, one or two micron 
diameters uh, for your shop? I, I, I want to make 0.8 micron drops. Right. Which which would give you a, a dry salt. If it was a sphere, which it probably won't be. If it was a sphere, it would be 200 nanometers. Mm -hmm. And if it was a cube, it would be 136 nanometer side. And I want Good. to keep the narrow spread around that. Um, and does that imply the top of the pyramid is 800 nanometers? Uh, the, the liquid drop, uh, if it was spherical liquid drop of three and a half percent solution, that would be 800 nanometers diameter, 0.8 of a micron diameter. But when that evaporates, uh, you get initially you get a very high salinity, about 26 percent saline with uh, crystals forming in it. And if you dried it out completely, which you probably wouldn't do, but if you did, then it would be a cube. Uh, or, or maybe a rectangular parallel pipette. And if it was a cube, it would be 136 nanometers. Yeah, I'm uh, asking about- A lot of the spray that is being done by Daniel is a lot smaller than that. It's a very wide spray that he's making. The last I saw, maybe he's improved it. And quite a lot of it is in the size range that the Norwegians say will work in the wrong direction. They're warm. What size and is that? Mentioning Daniel, uh, that's the uh, the work on the Great Barrier Reef by Daniel yeah, Harris. Yeah, that's right. yeah. Well, he he but, sent me he sent me this the size distribution which he had a while ago, and most of it was in the the uh, what's called the Aitken mode. Uh, it's it's a widespread, but a lot of it was in the Aitken mode, which um, the uh, Norwegians, uh, Alterskaya and Christiansen say, will work in the wrong direction. What size is that? Uh, it's called the Aitken mode, and it's about a quarter of what I'd like to have. And 200 so nanometers. Uh, no, 200 nanometers is great. It would be about 80, I think. I'll have to ch I'll have to check the sizes, but uh, it's it's what's called the Aitken mode after the guy that found ways of measuring it. So it's too small. And then um, what size? I say that's too small. I, I, yeah. I'm, I believe, I'm, without having done any experiments, I believe that it's too small. This is supported by the Norwegian work, and it is where most of Daniel's spray is at the moment. Okay, what oh, size nozzle? The last, I, last data I had from him. What and size nozzle? Him, Sorry, uh, what size nozzle well, he, hole produces a 0.8 micron drop? Well, he's got much bigger nozzles, but he's got a, 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 a pressure uh, 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 I think it's got a pressure of air in it, which blows them apart. Uh, he's using some nozzle technology that was done by, uh, I think it's done by uh, Armand Neukermans, and there's, it's using very high compressed air to, uh, in the water to to, uh, to to blow the drops apart. So they've got quite big nozzles. Uh, and they're not using what's called Rayleigh jet breakup. It's the breakup is done by the, the gas that's dissolved in the in the water. Now, once these sorts of um, uh, once there is funding for uh, to uh, to work through these technical questions, I imagine that they can be solved uh, very quickly. We saw what happened with the uh, uh, vaccines for uh, for COVID, mm -hmm. and uh, you know people say, "Oh, it can't be done," and then. Uh, as soon as you throw uh, a large quantity of money and, and a lot of scientific teams at it, it's uh, it's solved uh, very quickly. But I, I'd like to invite Jonathan Cole to uh, to speak. Yeah, hi, Stephen. Uh, Jonathan here. Do you envision a testing phase where you create your own working fluid out of distilled water and add sea salt to it to mimic seawater, but bypass the entire filtering process simply to uh, check out the, the nozzles? Uh, I, I hope to filter well enough that we can start with ordinary seawater. I'm really, I've spoken to the people who make the filters and they are very competent about it. And I think if we had to pre-filter and then dissolve uh, sodium chloride crystals, that, that wouldn't have the same uh, PR benefit. So I'd like to use proper seawater. I've had um, water from the first and fourth in contact with silicon wafers with lots of different cladings on since 2009 and the silicon is looking great uh, all the all the old treatments on the silicon we've got oxide films and other kind of are looking fine 
Um, so w w that part of the, of the of the stuff is is okay. There is a worry about what happens if you have water going at a very high velocity uh, going through a silicon nozzle. If there's any debris in it at all, it'll scrape off the surface of the silicon uh, oxide film, and that that might give us troubles. But uh, okay, I, I can I can I just uh, bring the um, uh, meeting to uh, to the main item on the agenda, uh, which is not about implementation. It's about uh, persuading. Uh, influential people that uh, this talk by Soros about refreezing the, the need for refreezing the Arctic. Hansen's paper which says that global warming's uh, on, on, on going, going to con continue well above uh, a threshold where tipping points can, can become uh, irreversible. Uh, uh, a combat uh, and uh, Tim uh, Lenton and there's other papers, Will Stephens, one I particularly like from 2018, uh, tells us that the, uh, there's a possibility of a, a tipping point cascade uh, with absolutely catastrophic uh, results uh, of many people calling it an existential threat. Uh, certainly existential for civilization because it would be very difficult uh, for our um, offspring to, to, to survive. So, um, so we, we, we've potentially got the material for a, a tipping point. Um, there are lots of people dissatisfied with the the uh, progress on reducing uh, fossil fuel emissions, uh, so we've got a, uh, so we've got a real opportunity to absolutely transform the the scene, the climate uh, solutions scene, uh, with starting with a priority on refreezing the Arctic. So, so how, how are we going to get this message across? How can we build on the work that Sir David King has done, Soros has done, Hansen has done, uh, and the Tipping Point people have done? How can we, can we build on that and persuade, uh, persuade people that this is important? Now, I must commend uh, Robert Chris. Uh, for writing to his MP, I think was it your MP you wrote to? Yes, it was Robert, indeed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, who, who's uh, who's got some influence? He's in some committee or other. I, you didn't say which it was. Well, Greg uh, is my local MP. Greg, Actually, I know him quite yeah. well because we used to be we used to be neighbours. But mm -hmm. um, uh, and I've been speaking to him about climate change for seven or eight years now. Um, and he was previously, for several years, the Secretary of State um, at Bayes. So he knows this, and, and at that time, responsible for climate change. Uh, what is Bayes? Level, at the level. So he's, he yeah. is very clued up on these issues. Uh, Bayes uh, Bay is, stands for business. No, the, the business, energy, business, energy, um, uh, business enterprise and industrial strategy. And industrial strategy. Uh, does he know that the officials there won't read any emails that you send them about climate? Oh, yeah. I mean, I don't, well, I don't know whether he knows that particularly, but I mean, I, I have had um, my, my experience of Bayes through, through Greg, I have to say, is that um, they talk to the people that they want to talk to. And they, yeah. they're in an echo chamber and they're very selective about who they discuss these things with. Mm -hmm. And that's why it's all kind of, um, it's groupthink uh, and it's a problem uh, and it's impenetrable. And I have to say that I'm not terribly impressed with Greg either, because I, as I say, I've spoken to him about this for years and um, his attitude has been extraordinarily um, ineffectual. And he, he, he has, one time uh, I was talking to him about the opportunities that um, greenhouse gas removal 
presented for UK PLC. Um, I said, you know, this is a fantastic opportunity for British industry to get ahead of this. We've got all this intellectual capital here. Uh, we're way ahead of the game. Why don't we, why doesn't the government get behind this and really make something happen? And he said, that's very interesting. That's, that sounds like something that should be done internationally. Why don't you find somebody to raise that at the UN? You know, what, what's he supposed to be doing? <laughs> but in yeah. any event, um, I, periodically I write to him um, and it, I don't have any expectations of it going anywhere, but he is currently, he is the, the chair of the Common Select Committee uh, for Science and Technology. And uh, those of you that may be familiar with the way the UK government system works is that um, there are these non-partisan, um, it, like they're kind of internal think tanks. So there's one more or less for each government department. And they're made up literally as, uh, as, as, it's, as it says on the tin from across the, the political spectrum. And they convene special investigations into things that interest them. Uh, it's, it has no legislative power, but it has some political influence and they raise issues of interest and it, and it goes on record. Um, and it's, uh, you know, it, it can be quite valuable. And in the past, they've had, you know, a lot of luminaries have presented to these committees. I mean, Caldera and Keith and uh, lots of uh, leading people in climate change and geoengineering have presented to these committees over the years. So um, I wrote this letter to him that you will have seen, um, which I, I spent, wrote it several weeks ago, and I, I thought it had just gone into the void. So I was really quite surprised today to get a response from him, um, which is what he normally does, which says, yes, I'll, I'll, I'll refer that to my colleagues and we'll think about it, which in my experience probably means that nothing will happen. Yeah. <laughs> so um, well, it is- But then anyhow, these... thank, thank you for, for trying, well, Robert. The, so- The point I want to yeah, make is- Do you have any- one, one has to keep, one, one has to keep kind of doing this because eventually I might be proven wrong and something might happen. And then of course, yeah. we'll be pleased. But uh, yeah, so yeah. it's a case uh, of- John, keep John what, what I suggest is that we, we just take a couple of responses to your question. Uh, Brian's had his hand up for a bit, then I wanted to speak and then, and then Rebecca. So mm. if we can go to, uh, first to Brian. Just a very uh, specific question for Stephen. Your target particles are 0 0.8 micron uh, water drops is that right That's and right. what what diameter of nozzle and what pressure provides you with the target drop based on your experiment right the pressure is 80 bar yeah. and the nozzle is i think 380 nanometers it's a bit smaller than you'd predict mm. if you'd read the papers from lord Rayleigh in 1870 uh, i can send you the, the the curves of this if you want uh, so 80, 80 bar is the is the one that matters Wonderful. Um, that sounds excellent. I look forward to following up. Thanks, yeah. Brian. Yeah. Thanks, Stephen. So, um, Rebecca. Um, well, I you, was going. To I think you you are doing yes. some uh, just just some hang outreach. on, John. We'll we'll come back to uh, Rebecca. So after, she after is there. I think Rebecca is ready I'm, to I'm answer happy the to question. I'm happy to let Robbie go first, though, because yeah. he probably John, uh, after you, Robbie. What we'll do, John, is we'll invite people to put their hands up, and if, and we'll take people's comments in the order that they put their hand up. So, uh, uh, other than um, uh, just uh, you know, you're welcome to uh, to make brief interjections, but uh, just for an orderly uh, process, we'll uh, mm -hmm. encourage everyone to use the Zoom uh, reaction technology of of hand up. So uh, I had a long conversation on Saturday with uh, my friend Eric Olbry, who manages the uh, science unit in the uh, Climate Change Authority for the Federal Government of Australia. And I've, I've uh, I worked with uh, with Eric uh, over uh, the last twenty years, and we're we're good friends. And he commented that. Um, uh, um, solar geoengineering and brighten the planet brightening the planet and so on is uh, simply not uh, visible in any way to uh, the climate change authority uh, in australia they uh, they never receive um, any uh, information about it and um, that uh, he uh, he feels that uh, uh, the uh, the questions uh, like so i was saying to him you know is there some sort of uh, prejudice against this um, uh, approach to climate change, and his impression was, uh, no, there's not. It's it's simply that uh, there's no uh, advocacy for it. And uh, so I said to him, well, you know, there's uh, quite 
uh, active um, Google groups on uh, carbon dioxide removal and geoengineering, as well, of course, as, as our uh, Prague and HPAC and other groups. Uh, he was completely unaware of uh, of any of that. He was uh, completely unaware of of any of the work that's that's been done. Now, I I, I did say to him that uh, you know my view is that uh, the uh, the politics around uh, freezing the Arctic uh, could put, uh, could prove um, very difficult, and uh, that it may be uh, possible for uh, for Australia to uh, to take a lead by uh, by expanding the uh, Great Barrier Reef marine cloud brightening work to uh, to uh, to a broader uh, oceanic approach, especially in the Southern Ocean. Uh, he thought that was a very good idea. So anyway, I'm going to uh, to write directly to Eric uh, by email, and uh, so, so have, have, have you have you, uh, have you uh, put forward the the Prague the various Prague uh, arguments and papers and and the diagram that uh, well you'll only have, only have just received our latest version of, of the diagram. The, I'll, I'll, I'll diagram if if somebody understands graphs at all, uh, it's very plain uh, the trajectory that the current uh, IPCC is taking us on uh, is into a, a tipping point area, and we need to cool things. We need particularly to cool the Ar Arctic, uh, and and we need to to do with global warming. So, so he says he's uh, never received some lobby. So, uh, so what, why don't you promote Prague? This is a yeah, big I will. Uh, that, yeah, yeah. So that that's exactly right, John. And uh, so, what I propose to do is to uh, draft a a, le a letter email to uh, to Eric, just uh, essentially informing him of the uh, the scale of uh, debate and work that's happening internationally like we've, we've had uh, a series of prominent articles in the united states and the uh, the five-year uh, program from uh, the biden administration and uh, and the salter paper and uh, sorry the uh, soros um, talk uh, uh, supporting stephen salter's work and uh, so there's uh, there's a series of things that say uh, the australian government should take this seriously and uh, so I've been uh, the it, it's the the politics here has been uh, a bit toxic uh, for this uh, this question quite partisan. But anyway, I just wanted to let people know that I'll I'll take that forward and uh, just leave it at that and uh, perhaps hand on to Rebecca. Hi everyone. Um, my comments relate to what Robert Chris said a few moments ago about groupthink, which is the thing that's taxing all of us. Um, I think, as Robbie just said, there's a lot of interesting scientific things and public relations things that have happened recently. I mean, public relations is George Soros. Um, I think that um, Kelly Wanza's report or the silver lining report in the podcast by her fit in the middle, like it's very solidly based on science, but it's trying to breach out into the changing public consciousness mode. and. Um, I had it as an action last meeting and I'm only at the beginning of it, but I had an action to try and get our material and turn it into something grabbing. And I was particularly, um, what's the word, motivated because this um, man talking about rewire Australia and rewire America, he's been on our national news before, but he was on again last night. And he makes it sound so simple and appealing even though the climate science underneath it is actually sort of gobbledygook, but there must be a way. My main point is there must be a way to get what we're saying and turn it into something really catchy based on the solid science. And that's my action to try and do that. And I'm in the middle of it. Mm. Well, I believe the, um, the excellent uh, thank, thank, that we've thank been you. discussing so far is to rebrighten the planet. Well, it has to be for a reason. And I think the urgency of the Arctic is the reason. If you read the um, uh, Silver Lining report, it's actually talking a lot about experiments and it's quite a positive report. Like a lot of everything is reading between the lines. And then when you hear an interview by someone, they say a lot more than what's actually in the report. 
So um, the other little piece of inspiration is something that Doug Grant sent, which was interviews even with Jim Hansen. It was all like one-liners and the whole video came to about two minutes. But that's the sort of thing I think we ought to be thinking about with our story is really prominent people. And I even wondered, Robbie, whether we could reach this, um, whatever his name is, Saul Griffith bloke. Um, I'm not sure whether he's, I'm not being condescending. He's got his energy that he's putting out rewiring Wollongong and whatever, whatever. But I thought if he would come on board or we could chat with him, he'd be a really good person to have on board. Yeah, I think re re uh, re the Arctic is a key step to refreezing the Arctic. And the, what I'm saying is that re the Arctic is the main message that is different from the general message in the SRM community, even though even that particular message is not um, widely accepted at the moment. But even if you're in that worldview, then the Arctic is not a key theme that is coming through. The problem is that there's lots of government influences in different directions in the Arctic. And it may be that we could do something a bit better in Hudson's Bay because there's only one government around the whole of Hudson's Bay. And uh, there's uh, a move on to try and get the Pugwash group interested in this. Uh, I'd be perfectly happy with just making a few clouds over Hudson's Bay just a tiny little bit whiter. And that will teach us everything we really need to know about uh, the, the technology. But we don't have to go quite that far north to 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 refreeze the, the North Pole. And we okay. don't have to, to get all the governments around the Arctic to agree to it. If we can do the Hudson's Bay, then I think everybody will be easier about, about doing it to the North Pole. I would agree there. How would we get the financing for it? Um, well, uh, there's a, a lady called Meta Spencer. I've given her your contact details. And I, th I think she's wants to combine it with giant kelp as well. Yes, um, we've done two webinars so far with Meta, and it's been a good yeah, start. And she, I'm just thinking she, where are the funding sources. But yeah, go ahead. All, all, all I said was you must try and do it in different places so we don't confuse the outcome. Um, but I, 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 yeah. <laughs> um, but so the is, is big enough for big enough for both of us. Is, is Cambridge um, aware of uh, the Hudson Bay proposal? I don't so know. Like, no, they're not. So Are if um, if it were possible to uh, just inform Sir David that a uh, a field trial in uh, Hudson Bay is uh, something that could usefully be advocated to the government of Canada, then uh, I, that sounds like um, a very yeah. constructive option because mm -hmm. if if Sir David were then able to, um, uh, uh, I suppose, lobby uh, Trudeau and uh, and the Canadian government, uh, and uh, it, it, like for example, engage Soros on 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 that uh, on that suggestion, um, then uh, that sounds like uh, a very feasible thing because uh, like the, the whole point is, uh, you know, you don't want to an antagonize Russia. Um, uh, around this sort of stuff by trying to uh, trying to get them to cooperate in anything when they're preoccupied with with other stuff and um, uh, yeah so uh, like you know international cooperation is just slow and so finding ways of um, uh, proving a concept that don't require international cooperation like that's supposedly what Daniel Harrison is is doing uh, in Australia, but it just seems very slow. Uh, but uh, you know, I think that if if Stephen were able to get some funding to uh, for a Hudson Bay trial, and uh, so Stephen, you're saying that the uh, the geography and so on, the meteorology of, of Hudson Bay is suitable for a field trial. Yes, what I want to do there is to get the spray being released from. The spray equipment inside an ISO sea container. I want to defer the actual movement of vessels driven by the wind. I want to have them driven by an electrical output from a wind turbine and only use results when the wind was blowing in the right sort of direction. Uh, and it'll be a few photographs of clouds looking whiter along the direction of the, of the plume, little, little 
give us all the information we need. We can quite separately solve the problem of how to generate the energy anywhere in mid Pacific, and, and that that I think that could be built very soon. I can you know I've got all the tolerance dimensions drawings ready to give to manufacturers, but the questions that we we really want to answer are about uh, particle size and the way uh, things behave in the in the turbulent boundary layer. And uh, you know, are the is the analogy of the glass balls uh, 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 working properly for 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 clouds? Now, Rebecca's made a very good point about the the need for um, indigenous um, literacy. And uh, we've seen I, what I was uh, quite perturbed by uh, in uh, the uh, the recent M MIT Technology Review article on iron salt aerosol was that uh, one of the uh, one of the negatives about iron salt aerosol is that it causes uh, marine cloud brightening, and uh, his his, <laughs> reason, his reasoning there was that uh, because marine cloud brightening is associated oh. with um, solar geoengineering, uh, that it's extremely unpopular. And uh, that's so that if any other technology had um, uh, planetary brightening as a side effect, then it would be more difficult to, uh, to wow. get political support for it. So I think that this illustrates the, uh, the level of uh, confusion that uh, that surrounds this whole topic, and so the uh, the risk that uh, an endeavour to um, conduct a marine cloud brightening field trial in Hudson Bay would uh, see uh, organisations like uh, Greenpeace and ETC uh, going and lobbying um, indigenous communities and feeding them with piles of disinformation in order to uh, put push them up front as a uh, and what what the the argument is from uh, Greta Thunberg is that uh, you're applying exactly the same sort of uh, domineering uh, thinking that uh, got us into the problem in the first place that was uh, Greta's specific argument against uh, all geoengineering in her book now as we know it's a, a thoroughly incoherent um, argument and uh, and yet it's uh, it's language that has uh, taken on, uh, you know, a really strong uh, social purchase, and uh, so uh, uh, like to to conduct. Like, I, my view, I, I saw uh, Meta's suggestion for a Hudson Bay um, trial that she uh, circulated to uh, uh, to our lists, and um, yeah. So the the two things are the uh, well, really the three things. Are uh, the uh, the political support, uh, the the finances, and uh, the social license to operate, and uh, so uh, so achieving that social license to operate, as Rebecca has uh, uh, has has indicated, uh, could well be the the deal breaker. Brian, yes, I think um, there may be a relatively simple solution to this, and that is um, something I worked out uh, in Rome with the. Uh, governance, safety and governance group of the um, group that met in May of 2018 in Rome. And that's where I met Sir David King as well. And effectively, if we develop these solutions and then provide them as a menu to local governance committees, uh, including local indigenous peoples of solutions that will have particular effects. In other words, there's probably a lot of support um, within the coastal communities around Hudson Bay for being able to refreeze portions of Hudson Bay so that they can and they can use the ice uh, mm. effectively so they can re have their traditional ways of fishing and, and operating and so uh, you know by specifically offering these as a menu of local solutions that could help to rebrighten Hudson Bay um, you know refreeze the portions they wish to have refrozen um, then uh, they can provide the governance thumbs up or thumbs down on various approaches. And we present them as a menu and include marine cloud brightening as part of this. And I really like Stephen's suggestion to take an ISO shipping container, power it off wind. And when you have offshore winds, you can be right on the coast. You can generate the 
uh, the spray particles and those spray particles could, will dry and, and provide the springtime and summertime cooling and reflection that'll be needed in order to keep the ice going. Um, that's a great opportunity. And uh, we just need to present them as a set of menus. And when we budget for something like this, and I think we should talk with um, Sir David and others about funding such a program, um, that we budget a fair amount. <laughs> the adage we like to say is, you know, engaging the indigenous community is feasible, uh, but it usually takes twice as long and costs twice as much. And we just need to budget for that in order to get the local acceptance um, and be able to do the small trials and uh, small experiments that can lead to larger trials over time. So I think there is a governance framework that works. And ironically enough, we forged this in May of 2018 with one of the founders of the ETC group. And he said his primary interest was simply in ensuring that, uh, well, we could effectively at the UN or some other venue um, produce a menu of, uh, of, of rebrightening solutions, uh, I'll say, that can enable the, um, the global South, as it were, to uh, lead the way at holding the line at 1.5 degrees Celsius with these various cooling techniques. And ultimately it should be a um, governance by each of the um, you know, nations that would be affected in their region. Thanks, Brian. Now, Robert Chris had a comment in the chat that he might like to expand on. <laughs> well, it's just that you were mentioning um, Indigenous peoples, and <clears throat> you're probably aware that um, it was the uh, intervention of the Sami people uh, in uh, Finland that was instrumental in killing off uh, David Keith's Scopex experiment a while back. And uh, I know Tero from uh, contacts through the Cambridge, uh, the Centre for Climate Repair at Cambridge. And uh, I, he's a really sort of charming, nice guy. And so I emailed him recently uh, and said, you know, I'd really like to talk to him about this because I know that the Indigenous peoples are, they've got a real issue of principle um, about any kind of uh, intervention of this sort, which is perceived in, in ways, I mean, I have to say, I don't I fully understand this yet, but this is why I'm having this conversation with them. They perceive it as being unnatural, uh, you know, an unholy interference in, uh, in nature's way. Uh, and uh, that's, you know, where they're coming from. So I, I wanted to talk to him because if, as this group um, and others are coming around to believe or have already come to believe that albedo enhancement in some form or another is now absolutely essential uh, if we're going to address uh, issues of uh, you know, averting the serious climate catastrophe, then what it, it would follow that the indigenous peoples have to come on board with this in some way, because otherwise they're shooting themselves in the foot. If, every, if at every opportunity, they try and close it down. So um, I, as I had an exchange with, with Tara a couple of weeks ago and suggested we just have a, a chat, because so, I'd just like to understand more about where he's coming from. And I sent him um, some of the material that we've been talking about, the, uh, the Hanson paper and the Stefan paper, and, and um, uh, the, 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 I, I gave him a link to Tim Lenton's presentation at the NAS and so on, and, and suggested he have a quick look at it so that when we speak, he can understand um, where we're coming from. And I've had an exchange of emails with him today, and we're meeting uh, online, just him and me, uh, midday on Friday. So um, I'm hoping that I will learn something from this um, and discover quite, you know, where they're coming from, what their hot buttons are, and whether it's a completely kind of closed issue, whether there's room for manoeuvre, or quite what's going on. Yeah. So I'll, I'll, I'm happy to report back after I've had that conversation. That sounds excellent. I think it needs to start with understanding the forecast under business as usual. That's got to be the mm. grounding framework. Yeah, absolutely. Well, that's where I was coming um, from, you know. That, uh, uh, yeah, and, and, and I'll... I'll... Um, temperature trajectory graph makes that absolutely clear. Mm -hmm. on, on, on those curves, although they are never, uh, uh, IPCC never produces curves uh, of temperature there, they stick to CO2. <laughs> but but um, Han Hansen, Hansen has broken the mold and he's actually uh, mm. uh, sh shown a bit of graph of temperature rising. Mm. And he's also said verbally that the uh, the, the rate 
of warming is likely to double in the next 25 years compared to the last mm. uh, the previous 50 years mm. and uh, that's what we've tried to portray yeah. on our curve uh, in, in the diagram well, one uh, of the things that's uh, worthwhile uh, mentioning just in relation to the uh, to, to Tero Musterden is that um, of course he and his and his um, uh, fellow travelers probably know more about climate change than almost anybody else on the planet because they live in these in the Arctic region. You know, they're, they're, they're the ones that are, are actually have the lived experience of what is happening. Uh, with so, this, so presumably uh, they're, with they're, they're what, they are the pe people with the most at stake for refreezing the Arctic. Well, uh, and that's you know, what we're asking for. And, well, I think, uh, I think the answer to that question is that I'm not sure that I would agree they've got the most at stake, but they've certainly got the most immediate concern because it affects them first, but it may well affect others equally or even more in due course. So if yeah, the snow melts and then refreezes, the reindeer can't kick the snow out of the way to get the, sp the sphagnum moss that like they it. eat. Yeah. So they, they really understand that. They ought to, ought yeah, to be keen yeah, on it. Yeah. Yeah. Now, Brian has been talking about the uh, the Arctic megafauna as uh, as a key um, way of. Uh, I hadn't. Uh, I, yeah. Now that Stephen mentioned it, I had heard that uh, reindeer starving story, but there's also walruses and and whales, and mm -hmm. and others. And uh, so you know, use being able to uh, uh, say you know. Let's let's look at the counterfactuals in terms of the impacts on uh, megafauna of uh, uh, of various options, and this is a point that I've been making that um, uh, 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 rebrightening the planet uh, can enhance biodiversity, and that's uh, that's something that has uh, I I haven't found papers on it, but uh, you know that's it, it. I think that it's a it's a key argument. Well, well I was going to. Uh, right to uh, uh, Das Gupta, uh, who's written a report on, on behalf of the UK Treasury. Uh, and um, I, I, I sent a, a link uh, for Brian to look at because we were going to discuss how to word a letter and use the right kind of terms that uh, ecologists like. Uh, so, Brian, do you think I could? I, I should could go ahead and 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 make the points that Robert's just been making, which is that cooling the planet was would help uh, restore ecosystems and uh, biodiversity. I would start with the example of the Arctic, and uh, happy to follow up with you. Especially, just um, let me know uh, the date of your correspondence, and I would start with a regional approach because it'll be a lot easier. I think to get uh, local buy-in for a regional refreezing of the Arctic, and um, let's aim for that first, and focus on those charismatic megafauna. And maybe I, I think it's a good point. We might want to try to organize a paper on how refreezing, rebrightening, and refreezing the Arctic would enable a restoration of the biodiversity that we know existed historically. So right, let's let's make that an action point. A paper on how refreezing the Arctic would help. Yes, and in fact, we should try to find some top uh, Arctic marine ecologists uh, to work with to collaborate on such a paper. Excellent. So we've got one really good action out of this meeting. Uh, well, we've already been notified of some excellent work uh, that Robert's going to do with the Australian government by putting forward our prag arguments. And, and Robert Chris is going to do uh, with, with going to, uh, uh, to an indigenous person. And uh, Robert, can you show him your uh, the prag graph of of temperature trajectories, because I think that speaks volumes. Mm -hmm. Yes, indeed. Yes. Yeah, lovely. One of the questions that I've I've heard about graphs 
is uh, that uh, many people find them, you know, extremely intimidating, uh, regardless of how simple they may be to uh, to somebody who who understands them. So, so there's a, a quite a need for caution. And you know, I've I've had the same sort of experience with um, equations that when I uh, I read a scientific paper, when when they do uh, have uh, you know just lots of uh, lots of equations. I find that my eyes glaze over a bit, and you know I've got quite a, a mathematical brain. But um, yeah. yeah, so I, I think that there's that, that, um, that, that, that's that's why I'm cautious with distributing this diagram because I don't want to frighten people with the diagram. <laughs> there, there, in fact, I mean the the message from the diagram, I suppose, is is actually quite frightening that we're uh, under the IPCC and the emissions only. Uh, uh, scenario which the world is pursuing, where we're where, uh, we're heading for a catastrophe. So that's quite frightening. <laughs> the graph itself is is uh, is, is sh shouldn't fright, frighten people unless they're mathematically, uh, you know, allergic to maths and allergic to that kind of thing, which some people are. Um, uh, let's go back to Rob, Chris. Yeah, I just wanted to quickly pick up on uh, the reference to Das Gupta's uh, report. Um, mm. it, it is a hell of a book because it's 600 odd pages. But um, for those of you that have never seen it, it is worthwhile just downloading it and having a quick browse through it because it's really, really well written. And it's really interesting. And, and just scanning it, picking up, read, reading random pages, there's a lot of really, really good quality stuff in there. And you can find it very easily um, by just Googling or searching for uh, Das Gupta um, Biodiversity, and it'll come up. It's, it's under a UK government, available from a UK government website. Um, but it's, it is actually a quite impressive piece of work. I, I, I know I have no idea what happened to it once he issued it. I suspect it just went into a drawer in some department and got totally ignored. But it, from, <laughs> but it is nevertheless an impressive piece of work. I, I, I... I kept my kind of eyes open for a a response to it, but I didn't see any kind of re mm. uh, review of it or mm. <laughs> or anything. <laughs> As you say, it seemed to disappear. But but he has established himself as a a really good uh, e ecologist, and I think with this report, uh, as you say, mm. you're confirming my my feelings mm. as a non uh, ecologist. Um, I, I did do some biochemistry at, at Cambridge, so I'm not totally ignorant. <laughs> um, but um, yeah. Um, now I, I so, put the link to that report. So I think he, he would be a very useful person to write to, and and put forward this idea that actually cooling the planet and cooling the Arctic in particular, we can make a special case for that. Uh, you remember, he's also another really one of these people. In the, he's another one of these folk in the Cambridge um, uh, little circle. So uh, he's also, uh, I think, he's a Trinity Fellow um, as well. So he's well known to David King and Sean and uh, Gerald and, and Hugh Hunt. And I have to say, on one occasion, uh, I had the pleasure of sitting next to him at dinner. There, I was totally and utterly awestruck. <laughs> but, uh, uh, very good. Yeah. Now, um, Rebecca has uh, put a comment in the chat about uh, regional effects. And I'm just wondering, Rebecca, is, is that something that you wanted to speak to? If you're with us? Uh, Rebecca might not be. Uh, uh, she was uh, she was on the bus, I think, so she might not be there. Anyway, it's it's a good point. She says, uh, uh, Kelly Wanza's podcast is um, says Greenland ice sheet affects the Florida climate, and um, that's uh, regional studies need to consider the these sorts of faraway effects. Um, Hi, I am here, and my main point here is popularizing what we're doing. Kelly Wanza's podcast and the Silver Lining Report are absolutely amazing, and. Everything we're saying is still pretty technical, which of course is the base, but um, there were a lot, lot of catchy things in there about 
some, you know, what, what happens here affects there. And I think if we, my main point here is if we're talking about regional effects, which I think are really important and trying to work with the local indigenous people to say, you can may be able to refreeze the ice in your area, they still can get approached by farmers in Florida or here or there saying, what are you doing, you idiots? And are you aware you're stuffing up the climate? So I just think we ought to go big picture all the time, even when we're trying to work regionally. And Kelly Wanza was very positive about it. Mm, yeah, thanks. Thanks, Rebecca. So um, we um, work... has, has, has Kelly seen the uh, Prag uh, output, uh, Rebecca? Well, I don't know, but I think we should try and Someone in um, HPAC, I think, probably has her email address because I was looking at a podcast from a long mm. time ago. Um, I don't mind writing to her if someone gives it to me, but I thought we could ask her to engage with our material. So if someone gives me the email address, I'm really happy to have that as an action. And I will consult with one or two people before I do it so that it's not kind of out of the blue. It's, it's in the right tone and all the rest of it. Um, understood, uh, Rebecca. If you can give me the address, I'd appreciate it. Yeah, yeah. Well, okay. Somebody, can find, somebody right. can find that, I'm sure. Let's hear from Mana Jo. Yes, I just want to point out that uh, here in the Hudson Valley, we're starting a climate science series to give people the context. Uh, um, and we're starting uh, with Dr. Kirsten Menking from who's a, a paleoclimatologist at Vassar. Uh, and then two weeks later, uh, one of her colleagues um, is an oceanographer and will be explaining the relationship with the um, currents. Of course, that will include both poles, but it will also include the atmosphere. And we're trying to just get people give people an opportunity to learn, learn um, the basic climate science so that as these technologies come up, uh, we have a more knowledgeable, a knowledge base uh, for context. So I, I just want to mention that um, when we get, we have the details already for, um, the first one, but as we add to that, I think the third one will be um, uh, Margie Turin from Lamont Dougherty Earth Institute uh, just came back from doing research in Greenland. And I don't expect any of these folks are uh, following geoengineering or taking it seriously, but they do have good information. And I think starting with the history of climate change makes a lot of sense. So I just want to let you folks know, and I'm, I'm also selfishly doing it for myself and you know my own curiosity so that I can follow and have a context for these conversations um, from a more educated base. So I, I just want to let you know that's what's going on here in the Hudson Valley. Thanks very much, Manager. Right, now, uh, where are we? Uh, perhaps back to John Nissen. Do you want to? Um, yeah, uh, uh, well, that's that's very good uh, outreach, Manager, and uh, that's good news. Uh, uh, we haven't had from a grant, uh, uh, I can see Grant Gower there, um, uh, I think you've got some ideas on uh, uh, for for cooling and uh, on on the political side. I think you're quite uh, uh, savvy on on what kind of approach might work, because I think we've got a huge opportunity here to, if if we can get the right kind of people uh, in 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 various aspects you know ecology economics uh, uh and, and 
uh, perhaps even the politics, uh, we've got a good uh, chance of, of, a, of a social tipping point where everybody suddenly clicks uh, about uh, the, the, need, the need for a, a cooling intervention uh, for, the, for our future. Brent, did you want to respond to, to John's uh, question? Thank you, John. Uh, my my position at the moment is uh, framing an approach to the government of uh, current lead, uh, administration of the state of California. Uh, certainly, the events of the last few days have, with the uh, recognition by luminaries of the need for global cooling, uh, has elevated this to a point where I now believe I can frame a, an approach to the committee that advises the governor of California on science that it's time for another look. Uh, California has been following the, well, we'll just have to capture more carbon in our route. And that would probably mean that in the timeline timelines that they're projected, we will stop having energy in the state, uh, which is probably not a economic solution. Uh, so I am collecting information, the mat collateral material that this and other groups have been uh, generating is hugely valuable. And so I am framing an approach uh, to get to that committee. The other activity I am trying to generate energy into is communicating on a local basis through a small publication, uh, local generated newspapers. And I will be talking with the publishers and editors of two of those types of uh, publications. My goal there would be to have one or any one to uh, create just a regular weekly uh, note on climate change uh, and the need for uh, action, uh, providing access to educational material. That's where I am. And thank you for inviting me to speak. Thanks, Grant. Thank you, Grant. Have you Excellent. had any progress on the EHUX uh, algae uh, work? There has been no real progress in several months as the uh, scientific team of which I am a minor part has been uh, sidetracked by uh, some other activities. Uh, I am trying to raise their interest in uh, cooling uh, their focus at the moment has been elsewhere, and so. Okay, um, thanks. Media progress. Uh, um, now we. Uh, there's been um, there have been various um, comments about um, uh, algae and uh, phytoplankton in, in the Arctic. Uh, Brian has uh, thinks that we could uh, do something with. Um, uh, growing plankton or promoting plankton under the ice uh, and that uh, we could perhaps use that uh, kind of technique um, and then we've got Sev with uh, Sev Clark with his floating flakes uh, I, I, I think something uh, good could be done uh, fairly simply uh, in the Arctic, but but we would probably uh, get a huge amount of resistance from uh, the kind of people who don't like uh, interference with oceans. <laughs> but uh, well, actually, uh, the, the, this can be put into a restoration context. Dr. Mar Fernandez uh, has worked extensively on the Arctic uh, algae that grows. It's actually perhaps macroalgae growing underneath the uh, sea ice, using the light that's available in the spring and summer uh, and using the ice as a substrate. So it's a 
it, it's an interesting approach, and I think framed in the Arctic in the context of regenerating Arctic ecosystems, this is a key um, primary production that can help the uh, fish under the ice as well. Yeah, uh, sorry, who is this uh, person you mentioned? Dr. Mar Fernandez is in Germany, and she uh, is leading uh, some efforts with macroalgae in the Atlantic Ocean, I believe. It's really quite a vast field at the moment. Like there's been, uh, I, I just monitor the um, uh, references to uh, major new research on um, algae uh, issues uh, in, in the uh, carbon dioxide removal Google group. And uh, there's just far too much for me to, uh, to keep up with. Um, uh, similarly, with like there's a series of fields uh, Biochar is another one that comes to mind, where uh, you know the, the quantity of uh, of re uh, research that's coming out is just so high, and uh, like I think it's it's led us here in in Prague to you know to focus uh, on the uh, the on albedo as uh, as the theme uh, for uh, for our work, um, but um, like a uh, yeah. Public, so yeah. so so my thought about the the algae is that that they might in some way uh, improve the albedo in the Ar arctic uh, and they might also help uh, either to, to prolong the life of the ice by having a bit of insulation uh, to stop it uh, melting from underneath so quickly mm. uh, and, and they might uh, form little uh, platforms on which snow would settle and or ice uh, form or something like that. Uh, so so the, there might be uh, some ingenious effects which we could utilize. Uh, and, and of course, it's extremely scalable. Um, the, biggest, the biggest one that comes to mind immediately is the social acceptance. In other words, if we can identify this form of primary productivity as helping the ecosystem uh, by regenerating the Arctic biodiversity, that's, I believe, how we could get enough social acceptance to uh, get serious about refreezing the Arctic and rebrightening the Arctic. Hmm, very good. So, so what? Uh, pr product, make it productive, or, or what? Yeah, what, primary what, productivity. The the macro is yeah. due to primary production. Yeah, and uh, of course the that, um, the fishermen would like that. <laughs> definitely, they should do. Um, Most indigenous communities fish. Yeah. Manager, oh sorry, you've put your hand down again. Uh, now, yeah, we... I, I I meant to put up a thumbs up, and I hit the wrong button. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> Um, we haven't heard from uh, from Ben Ballard or or Evan Hughes. If if either of you would like to uh, to just uh, comment, you'd be very welcome. Well, as I monitored all of these discussions and emails um, over the last few weeks, um, and seeing the the uh, temperature trajectory curves, I wonder what percentage of climate scientists believe that the temperature would go up as we are seeming to believe? Have we convinced the science community? Or I guess my the, the question I would ask is to the climate scientists in general is if we would stop greenhouse gas emissions right now, would the temperature go up, stay the same or go down? Is there consensus in the science community on that? Even it's it's changing. Um, so uh, so now they, there's more of an argument about uh, uh, when it uh, whether it'll stabilize at two degrees, three degrees, <laughs> four degrees, uh, rather ten. than is is it going to go through one point five uh, uh, limit? And uh, it and there are lots of people saying it's it's obviously going to go through that uh, whatever you do in, uh, uh, whatever you did now now on, on the emissions front well that's, uh, among, so, that's among us i mean if you look at this climate science community across the board do they believe that well that's what i'm saying they're changing they they used to believe 
that uh, they by uh, reducing emissions they could keep under 1.5 but as we're at 1.2 and the rate uh, uh the, the warming rate is uh is is, is about 0.25 degrees uh, per decade uh you can, uh, you can see we're going to bust the uh uh, uh breakthrough with it within a decade or almost certainly i guess my question and, 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 and emissions even, are actually rise you know if anything well, emissions are rising is even my question is even more fundamental if we were to to stop emissions right now do they believe that it would level off that it would the problem is that off? these the, the oceans contain about 60 times more co2 than the atmosphere contained in pre-industrial times it's about 40 times more now so if you st did stop tomorrow all the co2 in the ocean is going to start coming back out again it's just the vapor pressure across the, the sea surface so uh, stopping now will maybe slow it getting worse but it won't make it any better at all and you're saying it's that climate issue. scientists 100 percent of them believe that um I think no, that, no, no. as John said, there's a change <laughs> happening. It's a different what's there happened, is a there's what's happening. There is a this, uh, you know, if, uh, and if you if you tell us that uh, five years ago, you you get kind of 90 90 percent of IPCC uh, uh, privately balloted would say uh, that emissions reduction could keep us under uh, mm. 1.5. But now I think it would be 90% would say we, we, we're going to go through the 1.5. And perhaps the best we could do on the missions is to bring it back to 1.5 uh, yeah. uh, 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 over this century uh, by doing emissions reduction. Of course, that completely uh, um, uh, neglects the tipping points and the tipping points by a, 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 a quite a high degree of agreement from science scientists generally that 1.5 above that is extremely dangerous from the from the point of view of tipping points so there's least... a couple of points to add there yeah. uh, the yeah. the uh, things uh, in response ben uh, michael mann has uh, uh, has argued that for this net zero commitment uh, concept that uh, net zero by 2050 would lead to uh, temperature falling, but that's uh, highly implausible. And yet he represents um, a, a, a mainstream view with it and within the IPCC. And uh, so what we've seen is, is a, a neglect. We had quite a good conversation about this at one of our recent meetings where uh, Robert Chris uh, drew attention to a paper which just said that that theory is based on um, ignoring everything that they don't understand. Uh, so they say, if we if we can't quantify it, then we'll say that it has no effect. And that's a completely unscientific, unscientific method. So it's um, uh, the, the other thing that's uh, uh, to, the other things to mention, the uh, impact of committed warming from past emissions is uh, is neglected. Uh, the impact of um, uh, sulfur dioxide from uh, from stopping uh, burning coal is uh, uh, is neglected. So, so there's a, a series of things that uh, that indicate that uh, you know uh, just a severe crisis without uh, albedo enhancement. And uh, so that's that's a, a basic point that uh, that we want to uh, focus on and and, uh, uh, and gain uh, agreement on. But it's 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 simply not understood uh, across the IPCC and rejected. So what percentage of people would you of science? You're still not answering the question. I, I agree with all, everything that you're saying about why we need to do it, but putting percentages well, is very difficult because, uh, like, for example, uh, in um, there was a, a very interesting comment from Chris Vivian um, about um, uh, Tim Lenton and uh, and others just saying that uh, the clear implication of their work is the need for brightening but uh, they still reject it, which appears to, to reflect a political consensus within academia. 
that uh, that geoengineering is taboo. So when you have this social taboo, uh, you often find that uh, that people uh, are privately uh, understand uh, the situation, but are not willing to say so. Uh, you're on mute, Robert. Yeah, you... So, so uh, that that's uh, why. Just say, can I just say, Ben? Actually, I'd be actually very wary produced... about. I'd be very wary about talking about thinking in terms of percentages because the question is not the the, the question you should be asking is not. What's the percentage of people that agree or disagree? The question is, who's right? Okay. <laughs> and the mere fact that the largest percentage say one thing doesn't mean to say that the larger percentage is correct. And, um, you know, one of the things that we have to be, one of the problems with this whole discourse is that um, it is riven with uncertainty. Uh, there's uncertainty about the data, the current data. There's a huge uncertainty about historical data, particularly as you go back into the the distant record. There's obviously impenetrable uncertainty about the future uh, and so on. So what happens is that people, um, uh, whether they are scientists or whether they are journalists or politicians, they, they um, how can I put this? They, they put the uncertainty to the use that best suits their worldview and their, their ideological position. So for those people that, that are fundamentally climate deniers, they use the uncertainty uh, to say, oh, don't worry about this because we don't need it. It's all uncertain. You know, when we know more, then we'll worry about it. And, and the scientists who are very, very interested in the truth use the uncertainty to say, well, this is what we know. Uh, I can't comment about the things I'm uncertain about because, uh, because I'm not sufficiently confident to make those claims, even though they may have suspicions, but because they are truth, uh, they, are, they are purveyors of truth, they're very wary about overclaiming their, their knowledge. So the, the uncertainty gets managed in these very complex ways. And one of the things that, uh, that, but, that Stephen and John have just commented upon is that we are right now in a, uh, in a transition point. We're on the cusp of a quite significant change. And the reason for this is that um, uh, one, of the, one, of the bits of, one of the bits of data I like is this. When the first assessment report came out in 1990, when the, when the science was very, un I mean, you know, the basic, direction of travel was, was well established. More CO2 is more warming. They knew that, but they didn't have the numbers, but they knew that they had to stop the emissions. So in 1990, they said that if we reduce annual emissions of CO2 back to their 1985 levels, you know, five years earlier then, then, and we did that by the middle of the, of the coming century, in other words, by around 2050, then we'd have the problem sorted. And Reducing emissions to the 1985 level in 1990 meant reducing them by 10 gigatons of CO2 a year. Now, what we're saying is, whether you believe this or not, it's another question, but what, this, what, the, what the orthodox uh, IPCC approach is saying is that if you reduce emissions to zero by 2050, which is in basically in 30 years, then we've got the problem sorted. So we've gone from 10 gigatons in 60 years to 40 gigatons in 30 years. In other words, the problem is now eight times bigger than it was then because we haven't acted, acted decisively in between. So all the while that we should have been controlling emissions, emissions have grown. They're now 70% higher than they were in 1990. So the reason that people's attitudes are changing is because, you know what? The facts are changing right in front of our noses. And that requires us constantly to be on our feet. We're very aware of the fact that we are, we are chasing the data. It's running ahead of us all the time. And we're, on, we're constantly playing catch up. So there's no surprise here that a lot of people haven't yet caught up and they're not quite there yet. But there is no doubt that folk like the people in this group and a couple of others are on the curve or ahead of the curve. And I think that what, you'll, what you will find is that the answer to your question, Ben, is that actually a relatively small percentage of the scientific community would share the views that we are expressing with such confidence today. But in five years' time, there will almost certainly be no one that takes a contrary view. And that's right. Where that's where we are. And the whole I think challenge. That's, I think that's right, Robert. And I, we've just got to. I, I would like to uh, uh, start to wind up. I'd just like to invite okay, Evan to, uh, to comment. Uh, yes, I was interested in what uh, Grant Gower said about uh, 
the California legislature and local newspapers. Uh, I'm in Menlo Park. Can you tell me what you were referring to? The, uh, in what particular way, Evan? You referred to local newspapers that you're approaching. Yes. What I, there's a local newspaper. I'm based in Thousand Oaks, Southern California. Oh, you're uh, in the South. Oh. Yes, having just experienced our first blizzard in living history. Uh, nothing to do with climate change. Absolutely nothing to do with it. Uh, I have, we have a local newspaper here called the Acorn, mm -hmm. appropriately for Thousand Oaks. And they are a weekly and they provide commentary on a local basis. And this is the first avenue that I am exploring to see whether I can get the publisher and the editor to create a feature just exploring the impact of climate change in this community and then expanding it out from there. Uh, you also mentioned the California legislature. What specifically were the, you thinking one of there? The, one of the leaders in the uh, having one of the spokespeople for climate in who I was put to by Susan Reed is the state senator for Malibu or from Malibu, which is an adjacent uh, electoral district here. I yeah, have I had mm -hmm. I have had com contact with his office, which has been so far unsuccessful. But I think now that there is certainly material that I can frame in such a way that will shock into uh, shock him into a response. Similar uh, position to what Robert Chris has uh, established with his local member. So that's what but, I'm exactly well, getting. Uh, I'd I'd like to uh, to finish up at, at half hour, so uh, I'll invite John Nissen to make final comments. Oh, uh, thank you, everybody. I think we've got quite a lot of uh, commitments, which is what I was looking for. Commitments to uh, communicate our message and consolidate it. And uh, I hope uh, Ben hasn't been too uh, put off by a difficult answer to his straightforward question uh, uh, and we'll uh, uh, try and push push the curve in the direction we're trying to push it because well I think we we're all feeling now that there's there's a social tipping point coming uh, when everybody real realizes that uh, we've got no alternative to, but to call the planet and call the Arctic uh, particularly uh quickly because of the uh, tipping points there so if, if there's a chance for ben to promote that somewhere um even if we've just got you as a con convert that's something we've managed <laughs> today oh, well, i talked to a lot of people about it and get their opinions and see what they think and i think that is the real question is so, to sum up my question is is the social tipping point really coming are we really on the board? I, 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 I think so. Uh, uh, there's the combination of Hansen, who is respected, right, uh, highly respected as as a modeler, uh, and as a as a very sincere scientist, who is is really trying to find the truth, um, against lots of lots of um, conventional thinking. Uh, let's not worry about. SO2, uh, the cooling action of SO2, he's pointing out that if we reduce our emissions and decarbonize too, too fast, we actually push up the rate of global warming. He also says that uh, the idea of that we could keep under 1.5 through emissions is, is, uh, is for the uh, uh, unicorns or the whatever you say it's for okay so uh, to, to finish up uh, i'll just mention um, that uh, uh, I've just, so so yeah. so so we've got lot, lots of commitments from 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 lots of you so i'm very pleased uh that we're going to actually do a lot of outreach uh, mm -hmm. uh in the next couple of weeks that's uh, brilliant so to finish up thank I'll just, you everybody uh, one one new thing um i've uh just heard back from david keith 
confirming that uh, he will uh, uh, speak with the Healthy Planet Action Coalition on the 3rd of April. And uh, mm. so I, I think that that's, uh, that's a really valuable uh, catch for us and uh, from uh, from Harvard. And uh, I, uh, it'll just be a Q&A with David, not a, a presentation. So if people have uh, questions that they'd like to put to David Keith, um, uh, please let me know and uh, uh, by email and uh, I'll uh, uh, um, put together a, a, f a few things that uh, that people are interested to uh, to hear from his work. So April third looks like an odd date. Normally, HPAC meets on a mon on a Friday, but the third is Monday. Well, the yes, uh, so uh, uh, Thursday. Uh, well, Friday Friday for you for, for in Australia. Yeah. Right. Uh, yeah. April third is an odd date. Uh, he said that uh, our original we had originally uh, asked him to speak on uh, the uh, the ninth of March, and uh, he's not available. And uh, and he said uh, the week of April third. So uh, so that does give us some. Uh, yeah. Sorry, it's a bit longer than I'd, I'd realised. It gives us a month to uh, 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 to prepare. Okay, so it's oh, sorry, that, 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 but, but Robert, that's the week of April the third, not April the third. Yeah, that's right. Uh, yes, sorry, my mistake. Okay, fine. So it's probably going to be on the third, hopefully on the Thursday, um, which is the normal HPAC meeting. Yeah, I hope so. Yes. Okay, fine. Good. Very good. All right. Well, uh, thanks very much, everyone, for joining. I think very constructive uh, conversation, and uh, I'll, I'll circulate the uh, the recording and uh, look forward to being further in touch. Okay. Well, Bye -bye. Thank, thanks, everybody. Bye. Thank you. Bye. -bye. Thank you.